I watched five obscure Comic Con panels so that you don't have to. Were they as obscure as this? I guess you'll have to. Like and subscribe or else you too will fall into obscurity. Obscure Comic Con panels, everybody. And worst the best. Doki Doki NBA players are anime fans too. This had to have been one of the most awkward panels I watched in my obscure panel watching journey. The panel presenter, Austin Oswaki, was helping out De'Aaron Fox, an NBA player, with a comic book that felt like it was inspired by him, but not written by him, rather written by all of the other panel speakers, which made for one of the most uncomfortable experiences. I thought I was going into a panel about a group of basketball players who loved anime, and what I got was... Do you read manga as well, or... Or um, funny thing, I actually have, I have all the mangas I think for 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 Z, but I've never read them. I know like they they flip backwards and stuff. And I I saw some like when I was in high school, like just going through the library and things like that. But I've never actually read one. Like what what the fuck is this? There was also this guy who didn't speak the entirety of the panel or have his camera on. It felt like I was forcing myself to watch this really nerdy dude try to convince himself that this basketball player was as big of a nerd as he was. I should have been in the panel like, you're in Fox, you've only watched two animes. This panel's a lie. It's a lie, everybody. Get away, run, run. And this lady who didn't speak until 18 minutes into the panel kept on calling him a mathematician because he was good at math in high school. And Darren, uh, Darren is a mathematician too, so that will come out as well too. <laughs> I hope you strategize in, in the game with your mathematical. Um... Uh, no, nah, I'm not gonna lie. I don't have an eye like geometry knowing that these angles gonna do this and this and that and that. <laughs> If this man is a mathematician, then I'm obviously a veterinarian because I got an A in my high school anatomy class. Uh, here's me holding up a cat. Well, it's fur. Um, I had to dissect it. I love cats. I'm sorry, everybody. It felt like a scheme to sell people his ghost-written comic book. Everyone else was way more hyped about it than he was, and he left 35 minutes into the panel. The panel was also so damn boring. It was such a grueling experience to sit through. Look, I'm literally falling asleep. Like, what? What is this? Like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know. Baking cupcakes, angsty goths, and romantic protags. This next one was not what I thought it was gonna be about at all. I thought it was gonna be about hot goth babes baking and talking about romantic protagonists. Oh boy, was I wrong. Instead it was four females and a non-binary person talking about the books and graphic novels they'd written. This panel wasn't boring and a complete waste of time like the first one, as I did find myself enjoying parts of it, particularly the parts where Shane and Garrity spoke. She wrote a graphic novel called The Dire Days of Willow Weep Manor, and it caught my eye. Why? Because it was about gothic literature and take some inspiration from Jane Eyre. And I love Jane Eyre. Read it. Look at it. Breathe it. Sensually feel it. Three of the other authors just talked about how they chose enemies to lovers tropes. Enemies to lovers trope. Enemies to lovers trope. I absolutely love enemies to lovers. And their books just didn't really catch my attention because I don't really enjoy modern romance novels. Besides the Wee Bear Bears romance novel, Raging as an Internet Celebrity, which I obviously had to blur out because it's hentai. The Heartbreak Bakery by A.R. Capetta didn't really seem like my style, but I know that they put in some recipes in their story, and that might catch some of your drifts if you like bacon. I honestly have no idea what I'm doing. Overall, it was a meh panel with mostly men novelists, but you could tell that they all loved what they wrote and the craft itself, so that was enough to be courageously inspiring. I'm also probably gonna buy that Willow Weep graphic novel from the homie Shane and Garrity, and we'll link it in the bio if it seems like something interesting to you. We're not actually homies, but she seems nice, so maybe we can actually be homies someday. Hit me up, Shane and Garrity. I'm gonna read your book. I promise. VHS 94. Here's where the panels get interesting. VHS is a dearly beloved cult classic horror anthology movie series with devoted fans. I am, in fact, a devoted VHS fan, so hit me up for that cameo. Here's my reel. Oh my god, so scary. Uh uh. So, being the biased man that I am, I wanted to choose this as one of the panels I went over as the view count was under 10K, and I don't think the movies are huge by any means necessary. So it counts as an obscure panel, okay, everyone? These movies are so damn weird. Literally, like, look at this. Did you hear that? This panel had everything we needed. Short explanations of what each short was gonna be about. Uh, mine takes place in a funeral home. Uh, Dr. F Dr. Frankenstein-like mad scientist. Um, SWAT 
uh, like a SWAT drug unit. The rat man. Uh, uh, lovable uh, militia goofs. Jennifer, the girl with glasses, talking about a slew of events that occurred in 1994. This was the year that Nancy um, Kerrigan got whacked in the knee. This is the year of OJ's Bronco chase. And a bunch of people cursing. Fill it with You could just up and amazing. What else could you expect from a congregation of directors making a grimy horror movie that takes place in the 90s and is shot in the VHS format? Hooray! Nothing less. We love it. The entirety of the panel was entertaining. And although it was just a conversation about the upcoming movie and what it was like to make it during the pandemic, it was an interesting conversation that gave insight into what it was like to make a movie in Canada. So I know this was shot during the pandemic, so I'm curious about how your experiences uh, affected the, the shoot of this. I think like the day we brought it to Canada, they went into lockdown and <laughs> they never opened back up. And it just got oh harder God. and harder. We did not bring it though, be clear. Not patient zero. <laughs> Those do not correlate. The only thing that was kind of lame was the 15 second clip that they showed at the end of the movie, which didn't really give the audience anything particularly interesting that was happening in the film. But that might have been intentional as it showed enough to see what type of cinematic style the film was going for without giving anything away. Brick Journal, building with Lego during COVID. This panel is probably one of the most, if not the most underhyped panel. It was awesome. As of the time of releasing this video, the entirety of the panel only has 572 views. What? There was a moving Lego art world. Like, go check it out. Obviously after this video, but go check it out. It was art for the sake of art with nothing to be expected in return. And that blows my mind. Everyone on this panel was asked to create a video that showed what they'd been doing over the pandemic. And oh my God, was everything they did just so breathtakingly beautiful. All of these people have day jobs, yet the dedication that it takes to create astonishing works of art like the ones presented here is awe-inspiring. This guy, Ben Smith, took on the job of creating this beautiful spaceship, which was an 18-month trek that included collaboration with other builders. These quilts were collaborative art that were put together by Deneen. Dave took over a Lego website and made it easier for builders to help one another with different techniques. And Flynn and Richard created this insane build that used movement to tell a fantasy story. I don't even like Legos, but this is amazing. The art of Holocaust survivor, Dr. Victor Frankl. I wanted to save this panel for last as I felt like it had wise lessons sprinkled throughout. We got to see Dr. Victor Frankl from the perspective of his grandson, Alex Vesley, Stephen D. Smith, who holds a collection of 50,000 written testaments of Holocaust survivors, Matt Dumford, who studied how comics pertain to the Holocaust, and Sandra Scheller, whose mother was saved by Frankl during World War II. Dr. Victor Frankl was one of the greatest psychologists as he founded something known as Logotherapy, which states that human nature is motivated by a search for life's purpose, aka the pursuit of meaning. Knowledge! Knowledge! Rather than the panel focus on his psychological findings, it focused on the art he did on napkins and on the back of flyers. He would draw comedic sketches, and these were very touching as you could tell that Frankl used humor and artistic expression to get through the struggles he faced in life, as well as convey situations he enjoyed. Here's one of the drawings I created in the style of Viktor Frankl on the back of a nicotine transdermal patch, um, which I used to quit smoking. It shows me dying of lung cancer. <laughs> yeah. Don't smoke, kids. The panel also talked about his personal life and how he learned to fly a plane when he was around the age of 60, which taught him about creating a false location above your destination to fly towards, which would in turn make up for the wind drag and take you where you wanted to land. This led him to think about people differently in terms of his psychological studies. If you take the destination for where it is on a map, as a pilot, you'll end up missing your target. But if you look past it, you'll find the way to the correct stop. Frankel applied that and stated that if you take people as they are, then you make them worse. But if you can assume the best of them, then you can see who that person can actually become. We need to take a look at ourselves and our friends for their and our capacity for being better rather than being taken and taking people as they are. As humans, we are constantly making mistakes, but it is those mistakes that make us learn and grow into better people. Don't drown or crash because you think where you are in life is your final destination. Rather shoot for where you can be and grow to look at your intentions while not having to be accepted but becoming acceptable. We drive the planes of our destinies and must shoot past what we believe is our dedicated path. 